think you've talked about chromatography in general. Oh, yeah, I've talked about chromatography, but you know how I screwed up and have you here oh, instead of you one day? And so I one of them comes next week or <laughs> So like I that? have not completed everything. I, I started resolution, but I have not completed But would you want Monday? Uh, yeah, I'm taking Monday anyway. Oh, oh okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No problem. You were not on on Monday. I don't right. know why I did that. Okay. We're good. Okay, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Today I get to, and I guess I get two days, to spend talking about gas chromatography. It's my primary tool for, for doing research. By, uh, I guess by practice, by training, I'm a flavor chemist. So I'm interested in the chemicals in a food that make it taste like it does. You know, when you have a, a cup of coffee, when you take a smell of that coffee, or you swallow and that kind of aroma comes back up, you're delivering somewhere between 900 and 1,000 different chemicals up to your receptors. It's quite a, quite a phenomenon. Out of those 900 to 1,000 chemicals, you say, good cup of coffee or bad cup of coffee. And so my business is separation, separation of volatile compounds, those that obviously can be smelled. So this is my tool. This is what I spend my time with. That's what the instrument is made for. It's made for separating volatile compounds, fairly low molecular weight. Can't do much with proteins, can't do much with sugars without making some kind of a volatile component of them. But any volatile materials, we do well at. Our mobile phase, as you would guess, based on gas chromatography, your mobile phase is a gas. Our stationary phase, we have a lot in common, or can have a lot in common with liquid chromatography. But our stationary phase will typically be um, a silicone-based material. And we'll take this SIO, silicone, oxygen, silicone, oxygen, silicone, oxygen polymer, and we put different side groups on it. So that stationary phase in our column can have very different properties, very different solubilities, very different interaction with different volatile components. So, a gas phase and some kind of a stationary phase. Uh, we used to call it gas liquid chromatography. Um, that would imply it's a gas mobile phase and a liquid stationary phase. You can't imagine that would work too well, uh, as you'll, you'll see. <laughs> so that was really a misnomer. There was never a liquid there. So gas chromatography is more commonly used today. In Europe, they'll tend to talk about high resolution gas chromatography. So those are the terms that you see used for the gas chromatography. The types of places where this technique is useful is really very, very broad. Uh, you're going to be doing fatty acid profiling at some, some point during in laboratory. And what you do is you take those fatty acids and you make them a little more volatile. You make esters out of the fatty acids in the fat so they become very volatile then they're nice for separation. They work very well for this te technique. So if you're looking at, want to know the fatty acid composition of any fat or oil, this is the technique to use. Does well in things even like cholesterol or different sterols. Uh, gases, maybe I gas package something. I'm afraid my food is going to oxidize, so put it in a package and I flush the oxygen out of it, fill it with argon, fill it with nitrogen more likely. What's the composition in that package? Take a little sample up, put it into my gas chromatograph. I can separate the permanent gases. I can separate oxygen from nitrogen, from argon, from helium, and so on down the line. Solvent purity, basically the purity of any liquid material. Solvents, sure, our solvents, most of them are volatile. We can do a nice job of separation. We can uh, determine water in foods. So we can detect water. It's a volatile compound. Any kind of alcohol, if you're in the alcohol industry, you're distilling, you're brewing, you want to know the alcohol content, good, you can do it. Sugars, sugars aren't volatile, but I can make them volatile. I can make esters or ethers out of them, so they become volatile. Same here. They're not volatile, I can make them volatile. Vitamins, typically not volatile, we make them volatile. Pesticides, yep, that's one of the real broad applications. Pesticide, herbicide detection that's made for it. Many different food additives, antioxidants, nitrosomines, carcinogens, <laughs> P 
PCBs, polychlorobiphenols, drugs, flavor compounds, yay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Or really, there's all kinds of, of compounds that can be analyzed. It's a fairly versatile technique. Oftentimes, it isn't the best technique. Uh, like I say, if you look up sugars, amino acids, vitamins, I have to make them volatile. If you do a liquid chromatography, you don't have to make them volatile. So you'll sometimes see gas chromatography used for things. Maybe there's a simpler way to do it or a different way to do it. But very, very broad application in the food industry. From a history standpoint, and your instructor will probably go through the history of how chromatography came into being, uh, really some time ago, what are we talking about? Uh, 200, not 200 years yet, but it's, it's getting there. Ago, 1906, separation of plant pigments, chromatography. We get down to gas chromatography, though. It was discussed in, in a paper in 1941. Uh, so that's only, oh, that's 177. Nope, so not, <laughs> no, not quite 177. <laughs> 1941. Okay, so we're talking about 77 years instead. There was a, a theoretical treatment of, of the topic. In 1952, the first real instrument was made. So it took 11 years from theory to reality. And when the first gas schematograph was made, it wasn't very sophisticated, as you can imagine. They were doing fatty acid analysis, and they could make the fatty acids volatile. They could separate them. But then they'd condense them in a trap and titrate them one by one. So if you got 15 uh, fatty acids, you have to do 15 collections and 15 titrations. Yeah. My 900 compounds in a cup of coffee would be a bit of a problem if I had to collect all 900 separately and measure them. So that, that was nice, but not, not really workable. 1954 is when we had our first detector on the end that could actually make this automated, make it run, make it, make it work, 1954. Today it's a mature technique, meaning it's as good as it's ever going to get. <laughs> We've achieved theoretical maxima in separation, sensitivity, and so on. And so, and that was probably 15 years ago or so that we reached maturity. That's not true for some of our other fields. Liquid chromatography is still emerging. They're still making uh, advances in separation detection techniques. Not so for us in gas chromatography. Like I say, we're as far along as we're, we're going to get. So we're going to spend a little bit of time, obviously, talking about the hardware. What is it? How does this operate? How do we make it operate well? And uh, a little bit about the applications. So what are we doing in this? First of all, our sample could be a gas. It could be. Simply taking some air, putting it in the gas schematograph. Everything is volatile. Okay. But more than likely, our sample is going to be some kind of a solvent. It's a solvent maybe made an extract of, of some plant material, some uh, orange oil, some other plant food material. So we may use a solvent extract of our food, and then we have to vaporize. We've got to change that solvent into a gas and everything that's in that solvent. So we go ahead and inject it into a very, very hot port. We take a syringe, go down through a septum, inject it into 200, 250 degrees centigrade temperature. And obviously it just flashes, it becomes poof, now it's a gas. Once it's a gas, then our mobile phase is moving. Our compounds are moving with that mobile phase, but it's interacting with the column. And if your compounds like that column coating, they're going to lag behind. Those that don't really like that column coating are going to move through very quickly. So that's what we're looking for. We're really looking for how our compounds interact with this coating on the inside of our, our column. They like the stationary phase. They're going to stay with the stationary phase and lag behind. They don't. They're going to move through quickly. And hopefully, then separation occurs. And then, of course, we have to have some means of detecting those compounds as they loot out of the end of this column. I should have brought a call with me. I'll bring a call with me next time because uh, it's kind of, kind of interesting. If you're familiar with some other types of chromatography or chromatography columns, 
you'll kind of look at this and say, oh, that's, that's neat. It is neat. They can be up to 100 meters long. And they can be so thin, a glass you can coil it in a circle and make a 100 meter column in for the chromatography. It's really, like I said, a neat, neat technique. So let's look at the equipment itself. That's a little bit about separation. So kind of an, obviously an overview. But let's look at the hardware. Let's look at what pieces we find when we look at a gas schematograph. We're going to have to have some kind of a, a mobile phase. So that typically is a tank of helium. Helium is very inert. It's not going to chemically react with anything. It's very pure. So we need a mobile phase. So here's our helium tank. We need to control a the flow of that gas. So here's our flow controller that tells us how fast that mobile phase is going to move through the column. So we get here. We have to have some way to put a sample in. Now the sample, I mean, this is under pressure, right? We're putting pressure to make it flow through here. So one way or another, I have to put my sample in against that pressure. So I've got a septum here, a rubber stopper if you want to look at it in that way. I can take a syringe, pierce that stopper, and make an injection into here. And this is going to be the hot part, the injection port. So my sample gets injected in here. It can then go through the column and go through the detector and ultimately generate a chromatogram. We're going to watch those peaks come out as they loop from the gas chromatograph. That's, that's the simple version. Life gets a little more complicated than in reality. We oftentimes shoot, if our detector over here, that may be a detector that can work with this. But very commonly, we have a detector over here that is actually a flame. And I'll talk more about that later. So I need to have something that makes a flame, right? So hydrogen, gas, and air. So that's my two gases that come over to make a flame detector. So I've got, again, cleaning systems, I have control systems to control the flow. So looking more a little more detail, here's my injection port, my hot area. I'm taking a syringe, going piercing this, putting a sample in here. Here's my column, much longer, much broader. In this case, it comes out and it's mixed with the hydrogen, mixed with the air, and actually creates a flame. So we've got a flame burner here. If an organic compound comes out of this column, it's going to burn in the flame and it's going to form ions. And what we do is we measure those ions in the flame. If nothing's eluding, there's no ions. If some organic compound elutes, I'm getting ions. I'm getting electrical current that I measure. Again, we'll, we'll see that a little bit later. And then, of course, we've got to measure that signal and go over to an integrator computer interface that, again, shows you the compounds and quantities present. The gases, as I mentioned, here's our, our carrier gas. That's, like I say, is most commonly uh, helium. It can be hydrogen. It can be. It's interesting. I'll show you data either later this afternoon or this afternoon or tomorrow. I'm sorry the next time we meet for a class. So I'll show a little bit of difference between why we might use helium or might use hydrogen. And then, like I say, we oftentimes need some kind of gases over here for that detector. And that depends upon what the detector is. Some detectors don't need this, some do. And so we've always got to carry gas, and then we probably will have some kind of gases that make that detector work. The flow regulators, um, you will, like I say, be, be doing these uh, gas chromatography, doing the analysis. There will be regulators for flow. There will be regulators for pressure. And these are, are really a precision instruments. And I always caution people, you know, don't you turn them off gently. Never, never tighten them. Treat them with a great deal of care because literally you could break them. And there's hundreds of dollars if you happen to break these things. And you can get some of these things at a welding shop, but they're not the quality we need. And so the same for the gases. 
you could go down to the shop for welding supplies and get these same gases, but they're not the purity. It must be absolute purity. And so forget the welding stuff, get a good pressure regulator, good flow controllers for the system. They are, they are special. This one? Uh, yes, they are. The mobile phase, you can call it mobile phase. We tend to uh, talk about a carry gas. It's carrying our sample through the system. That's how we look at it. I should have pointed that out, Cindy. Yeah, <laughs> I changed terminology on you. <laughs> okay. Why would we have nitrogen? Oh, now you're talking about something that relates to the detector. The detector itself is happiest, <laughs> meaning it gives the best data, <laughs> if you've got a fairly rapid flow through it. And so what am I putting in? I'm putting in a clean but cheap gas. Nitrogen is dirt cheap in, in comparison. So to optimize my flow through the detector for sensitivity, I put in a makeup gas, which I haven't, haven't mentioned, yes. And that's just to optimize flow in the system. And we could use hydrogen, sure, uh, as a carrier gas too. And then I would only have one tank here. I'd have a tank of, of hydrogen, and I would not get the carrier gas. So we, we'll see that as we go through. So then let's, let's look at the different parts of the gas chromatograph, look at them in a little more detail. I said that we have to introduce the sample. We have to introduce a sample into uh, pressure, a pressurized gas. I've got my gas coming in. There's the pressure that takes it to force through the column to come out the end. And so I have to have some way to work against that pressure or to eject into a pressure. And so here's my, my carrier gas coming in to the injection port. This is all heated. So this is a stainless steel block. So stainless steel block, 200, 250 degrees centigrade. My carrier gas is going to come in here. And then a portion of it is going to go right by here and out and exit, a very, very small portion. Why do I have to have this kind of gas come across and dump it into the room, not use it? Well, this is 250 degrees centigrade, 200 degrees centigrade. I got a rubber septum here. That rubber septum is going to be giving off gases monomer, whatever happens to be left on manufacture of that septum. And if this isn't here, any outgassing of this rubber doesn't go anywhere. It goes down here into my gas schematographic analysis, and I get a nice gas schematographic analysis of my rubber seal. That's not what I want. I want to get a good run of my sample. So this gas passing by here just to keep the system clean. The majority of the gas comes down here so we make our injection here, our sample gets volatilized, and it's swept into the column. Some portion of it can also be back out and go out what we call a split exit. And I'll show you that in a little more detail a little bit later on. But this is the injection port. That's the normal configuration, a little bit of twist to it, but we'll, we'll see what, what they are. So, these are the different types of injection ports. The most common is a split injection port. So I go ahead, I've got a certain number of milliliters per minute gas coming into the system. It'll come down here and some will be split and go out here. A small part, only a small part actually goes on to our column. Our column is small. That's maybe gonna be uh, Oh, what, maybe a couple, 0.2 millimeters, 0.3 millimeters in diameter. So if you think about that, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 millimeters, it's tiny. We don't get much gas going through here. And so if we've got com gas coming in here, our sample vaporizes, comes down here, the vast majority of our sample goes actually out the split vent. Only a small amount actually gets into our column for separation. And there is a, a reason for that. If we 
injected one, two microliters of sample, it would just flood the system. Our little bitty columns wouldn't know what to do with it. So we actually throw away 99% of our sample in most cases just because we want a very small column. If it's a small column, it's efficient. So there's a reason. We don't want a big column. We want a small column for efficiency. So this is, permits us to inject measurable sample and then throws most of it out and puts what we want to analyze onto, onto the column. So splitless, we can actually set this up, and I probably do have a figure coming up on that, uh, where really I put all. You never get all. Okay, but <laughs> essentially most of what you inject with a syringe actually does go on the column. And so we'll see this a little bit later and I'll explain why. Some compounds may not like to be dumped into 200 degrees centigrade, 250 degrees centigrade. They may decompose under high temperature. Oh, that's a problem. So what you can actually do is have a syringe with a long needle, literally <laughs> a long needle. <laughs> and so you fill your syringe and you stick this needle and start threading it into your uh, column injection port and it goes right through the injection port right down into the column itself. So bypasses the injection port and is ejected down here where the column is cold. Cold meaning 40, 50 degrees centigrade, not 200 degrees. So we can have a split, which is most common, a splitless, which tries to give you greater sensitivity, or let's say a methodology where you can avoid the high temperature that you see in, in the instrument. And there, there are all kinds of other variations, but you know, by far this is number one. This is number two, and there's a small amount of this done. So these top three encompass 99.99% of the work, the work that's done. And this goes, it gives you an example then of a split column and put this into numbers, what I tried to, to show you. So here's our carrier gas coming in from our helium tank. We set our flow controller, we set it so it's 54 milliliters per minute of helium entering the system. We're going to take about three mils per minute of that 54 and put right out into the vent, into the room. 51 mils per minute then come down here. So three mils go per minute go here, 51 mils per minute come down here. Tiny column, most of that I said gets uh, dumped out. So if there's only one mil per minute, we've got 51 mils per minute coming down here. One mil per minute goes here, 50 mils per minute comes here, and again goes out a split vent. And so our split occurs at this point. And you can control the flow, you control the pressure on the system to get, again, the mobile phase moving as fast as you want in what, what quantity. This is the splitless version of this whole thing. Again, 54 mils per minute is coming in of your, your mobile phase, carry gas. Again, three mils per minute comes across here. What happens is then you can get the other 51 mils per minute coming down here. Well, you can, and let me see if we show that. No, we don't, okay. What you can do is you can shut this off. And so you're not going to have any split. You're just going to have a high pressure trying to back this or move this out. And so it's going to force your sample, much more of your sample here into the column. And then maybe at 10 seconds, you say, okay, you can go again. <laughs> and then you flush it all out. So your sample just doesn't sit there and keep on being added, 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 and added. Otherwise you'd have peaks, you know, that broad. So this is where you really shut it down so you can force more of that atomized material into your column and split less out. So if you've got really small quantities of, of analyte, very, you need really good sensitivity, this is the approach you'll take. Most of the time, like I say, you go with the, the split injection. This is the oncoloma said. I gave you a, <laughs> an idea of that. Here's your, your syringe up here. So you've got your sample up here in the syringe. Here's your nice long needle that goes all the way down here, completely bypasses your heated injection port here. Here's a valve that permits you to put this column down here without your gas coming back out. And so you actually put your sample down here in the cold part. This is the column 
where the sample is kept. And so you can actually then slowly vaporize or volatilize your sample. Not really. It does the sample have to be volatile to, to do this? What more than likely you're going to have, you're going to have your sample in a solvent, so it's not in the gas phase at that point. And you put it down here, there's a little drop of it. You pull your syringe out, you still got that drop. But this warms up, it self evaporates, and it starts on its merry way. It's part of the program, yeah, so you go in and you go to parameters and you say, I want to operate in splitless mode, you choose that selection, you say, and it says, how long do you want to operate in that mode, oh, let's do it 10 seconds, or 15 seconds, or 30 seconds. And then it, it simply does it for you, you make your injection start, and away it goes. Yep. So, in, in terms of then where we get our separation, well, that's a column. They, historically, when we first started this whole system, we had what we called packed columns. They were very large columns, very large, quarter inch diameter. I call quarter inch large. <laughs> that it is to us. Compared to 0.2 millimeters, it's large. <laughs> you bet. And so we used to have columns that looked like this. They were stainless steel. And our column was actually packed with a granular material. That granular material theoretically was inert, but you would put a coating on that material. Your stationary phase would be put around each of those granules. And so you would actually go ahead and pack this coated granular material into here. So it would be packed with this powdered material. But it had the coating on it that you interacted with. That's inefficient. It's really inefficient. But that's how we started the game off. Over time, we've developed glass capillary columns. That's 30-meter 30, 30 column that's wound about that kind of loop. You can actually take this glass, that's glass, and you can take it and tie it in a knot. It's so strong and so thin that you can bend it. And so what do we have? Instead of having a granular material here coated, we just put a very, very thin film on the inside of this glass. So you coat the inside of that column with this coating material. It solidifies, dries on, whatever, so we've got a really nice thin coating of our stationary phase throughout this. And so this is kind of an, an example here where we've got a coating. Although the coating isn't that thick as it shows in this case. The coating is typically in the order of, oh, two to three microns. So we talk about point, you know, 0.2 millimeters, a, a coating of one micron or two microns. So we're talking about really, really small diameters, small uh, uh, columns in that sense. The, uh, actually, the diameter commercially will range from 0.1 millimeters to 0.53 millimeters. Normally, we work around the 0.2 to 0.25, so we work in the middle of this range. We typically work with columns that can range from one meter has to be long enough to reach from where you inject to where it's detected. <laughs> that's, that's the limiting factor. It can be that short. If you get your separation, wonderful. And so it can also be up to 60 meters. I don't think we generally sell anything that's over 60 meters in length. And so, again, we work more in the middle of that range, like to use 15 meters, maybe 30 meters. It's kind of our, our workhorse. And again, these coatings inside, um, I say, let's say it's coating on the inside of that glass wall, that can range anywhere from 0.1 micron to 5 microns. Again, we're normally someplace uh, around the 0.25 uh, thickness. So that's a fairly common thickness for us, 0.25. So yes, a broad range, but again, there are certain ones that give us good efficiency, good capacity, good, good results, which I'll mention. These are some of the coatings that go inside of this column, columns coated with. 100% dimethyl silicone, so that's just silicone, oxygen, silicone, oxygen, silicone, oxygen. 
every silicone, it's a methyl group, methyl group, methyl group, methyl group. So that's our, that's our polymer. Very, very stable, very stable at temperature. Because we're going to take that column and we're going to run that up to maybe 200 degrees centigrade. And so if that coating on the inside doesn't heat stable, guess what? We evaporate it and we measure our coating at <laughs> the detector, not our compounds of interest. So it's really important that these materials are very, very stable to heat. That's very nonpolar, extremely nonpolar. As we start getting more polar, we can start adding things like phenyl groups on it. So it's a, maybe a, a methyl group, phenyl group, you know, silica, methyl group, phenyl group, silica, and so on. So we can start putting more and more polar materials on that silicone polymer. And so that's why we've got this, this range. So from nonpolar to intermediate polarity, we can't do polar groups well. That doesn't just work with that silicone polymer. And so when we get down to wanting things that are very polar, very water-soluble materials, we have to use uh, a, a polyethylene glycol. So we use a different polymer. Not as stable, but we just got no choice, got no choice on it. So again, we don't have a large number of choices. I, I guess that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight or nine, something like that. And that tends to give us a range in stationary phases that does our, does our separation. Back before this time, we had over 300 <laughs> different stationary phases you could put on. But these are so efficient, so good, they really cover that range in something like eight or nine different materials. Great, great materials. You know, how do we know what stationary phase to use? What coating should we put inside of that column? Well, these are generally the things we look for. Um, first one is published information. There's very little that hasn't been done by somebody else, some place. The wonders of the internet, uh, the wonders of translation programs. Uh, we can get a separation of almost anything today. You'll find a publication on it, believe me. So the first place you go to, you know, basically, first thing you need to know is, what do I want to separate? Okay. Then I start looking, who's separated these materials before? Who's published on the separation of these materials you want to measure? And so published information. There is something called retention indices uh, that helps us in, in a sense. And I don't remember if I've, it doesn't look like I have anything on it, okay. But in this case, what people will do is they'll go ahead and they'll just make a mixture of hydrocarbons from butane, pentane, uh, hexane, heptane, and so on, so each hydrocarbon. They will make a nice mixture of these hydrocarbons, inject it into the gas schematograph, and they will get a, a gas schematogram. If we have a, do we have a measurement? Or a, here we go. And so we'll make an injection here. Here's so that could be C4, butane, pentane, heptane. So we inject into our gas schematic a mixture of these. And then if you've got some unknown compound or you're not you don't know what it is, you then put that into your mixture. And oh, maybe it occurs right here. It will loot someplace in here. And so what you can do is you can kind of interpolate what is this of the entire distance. And so if you take a ratio of its elution time to this, you can actually get a number that characterizes that compound and where it comes out. And so you can use that because it, it goes by each column. It can be published by column. So these are called linear retention index. And if you look on, in Google, you do searches, you might find that benzene has a Colbatz index of 624. Oh, I know where that comes. I know where that elutes. That elutes right there, right between 6 and 7, about 24 between them. And so if I start looking for these numbers, I can start saying, OK, this column works for me. My compounds are going to come off in this region. 
that's maybe a little more detail than, than you want <laughs> or, or need to digest it at the moment. But it is a technique that helps us know how to separate things and under what conditions. It's really a useful technique. But again, journal articles, that's published information. Internal work, if you work in a company that does analysis, you probably have your own libraries, you have your own information. You want to separate these materials? Oh, yeah, we've done that before. Here's what we use. <laughs> so internally. If you don't have the faintest idea, and that, that happens now and then, I've had a person walk into my laboratory with a piece of drywall out of their house, and they come and say, my drywall stinks. Can you help me? Oh, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're a taxpayer. <laughs> Let's take a look at it. <laughs> Grind up a little bit of the drywall. You do a solvent extraction of it. You concentrate a little bit. You inject it into your gas chromatograph. In that case, you wouldn't have any idea. I had no idea what it is. <laughs> oh, okay. But you start off, and you start off with a very non-polar column, the silicone column. It's very durable. It I will. Anything. Food forensics, sure. Just like on television. Maybe even a little faster, right? <laughs> but you start off with with a column that's very durable. You know, you've got your isolate, your injection, and you look for it. Is there some peak in there that uh, doesn't it isn't in the solvent? If that doesn't work, you change to a polar comb. You start with a non-polar, then you go to a polar comb. These things are so darn durable, you can't destroy them. That's why you start with this. These are fragile, and so you don't want to start with your fragile column and be looking for things. You want to start with something that's durable. And that's specific Yep. Yep. And, it, well, Gas chromatography does really quite well in terms of resolution. This is the point where I usually harass your instructor about how inferior liquid chromatography is, but I'll try not to do that today. You told him it was inferior? No, I didn't say inferior. I said there's additional settings. <laughs> okay. I'm not teasing or honest. Okay. Okay. So, no. Gas chromatography is extremely um, good at separation. It's, it's, there's only a couple techniques that, that rival it, and they're um, very limited in application. So if resolution, if you have something that's volatile, or you can make volatile, you won't find a, a technique that's better at separation, resolving mixtures than gas chromatography. And part of the reason, or one of, certainly one of the reasons, there's, there's other, but one of them is that you can take advantage of different types of chromatography. You can look for adsorption chromatography. You can look at molecular exclusion, partition chromatography. These are fundamental techniques of interaction between analytes and your stationary phase, your, your column material. So you can always take advantage of at least one of these. And on top of it then, you get to add in volatility, boiling point. So between adding volatility to the fundamentals, you end up having an extremely uh, efficient method of separation. Some other things you know, that will also come in that I'll, I'll mention later on, but it is a really good technique, a powerful technique for separation. Um, column coding, stationary phases. I've mentioned that already to you, the, the nonpolar, yes, the silica-based materials polar or car carbolax. And it, it's interesting that every company tends to name these stationary phases by their own name. How's that? If you're buying it from Agilent, it's Agilent 1 or Agilent 624. Somebody else will call it Varian 1 or somebody will call it DB1. Um, so it's really a little bit frustrating that names aren't standardized of what these materials are, but you can find out from the company. So. You just have to take a look. So that's a little bit about the column. So we've got our injection taken care of. We've got a column. We take advantage of boiling point, as I said, as a means of separation. So what do we do? We have our column placed in an oven. And that oven can run in temperature from maybe minus 60 degrees centigrade, minus 60 degrees centigrade, up to 400 degrees centigrade. So if I want to take advantage of volatility, I can start off very low temperature. 
and only those more volatile things will move through the calm. Then I can raise the temperature a little bit more. Then those things that are you know, a little less volatile will start moving through. So I temperature program my oven. I start off at a low temperature. So I'm really taking advantage of volatility and continuously raise the temperature of the column to get all the compounds off. So ovens can run from about minus 60 to 400 degrees centigrade. So that's, like I say, these things are placed in an oven and we temperature program in most cases. What are detectors used for? I'm not quite sure why this works this way, but terrible, terrible peak, by the way. If I saw that kind of a peak in my gas schematograph, right, Meissen? You would, you'd throw it out, right? Yeah. Good, you good. I would hope so, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll see people aren't quite as picky. <laughs> okay, so we should have a nice, a nice sharp, a nice sharp peak to this, and so that's of course we're monitoring signal as a function of time, evolution time from from the column, and so we're going to. I can run it faster. <laughs> so. Uh, basically, what we're turning the presence of an analyte into an electrical signal. I mean, that's, that's what our detector does, right? And then we can work with, we can measure, we can monitor that electrical signal. So in all cases, we go away from, or we start with an analyte, analyte eluding, and finding some way to measure that. Detectors, there's, there's really many different types of detectors as well. There's a, you know, one of them that's really the workhorse. And so we'll just discuss the most common types. Thermal conductivity, that was our first detector. This is the one that turned this into a useful technique, being able to continuously monitor compounds. What we have in, in this case is our, our column is back here. The effluent out of our column is flowing across this and out. And so normally, this is helium, and so this just shows helium as, as a gas. This is a heated filament, so it's an electrical current flowing through this filament. This filament is hot. As it changes temperature, it changes electrical resistance. So we're going to be having carrier gas coming through here. We're going to have this heated. This is going to be running at some temperature then. But if the composition of that gas changes, oh, here's an analyte now that's coming out of the column, an organic compound. That's going to cool this more or less. And so it's going to change the temperature of this, and it changes the electrical resistance. So basically what we have is some difference in cooling of this, some change in temperature, and we monitor that for, for detection. This uh, detector has really broad uh, application, broad response. It'll respond to anything except the carrier gas. So it can't monitor, if, if we got our car more of our carrier gas coming through here, or simply carrier gas coming through here, we can't detect it. But I don't care if, if this is hydrogen, anything other than hydrogen that comes off the column is going to change the cooling. So it detects water, it detects oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, pentane, hexane, you name it. It detects everything. It's a universal detector, our only universal detector. Specificity, like I say, detect anything, a universal detector. Sensitivity is poor, 10 to my seventh grams per second. And you think 10 to my seventh grams per second, that's not a lot of material. That's a, that's a tenth of a, of a microgram, and that's poor. For gas chromatography, it is, it is poor. So it's not bad, but it's not in the same league as the other techniques. And so it only is linear over a change in concentration of 10,000. So if you've got two compounds that differ by more than 10,000 in concentration, it won't give you a linear response between them. And again, that's poor for gas chromatography. So that's universal detector, that's its advantage, its disadvantages, it lacks the sensitivity you oftentimes need, and it lacks linearity. Because we're using this to measure, we're using it to quantify 
various components in the mixture. This is our workhorse. This is the one that I've, I've shown you a couple times before already. This has been in a little bit of a better detail. So here's our, our hydrogen for our flame. Here's the little bit of nitrogen to make a better flow rate through our column. So our hydrogen and nitrogen gas are coming in here. Our air comes in here. So we will get a flame burning from the hydrogen. Our column, so it comes out here, gas. Well, here's where our column ends. And then its flow comes right up through, whoops, I guess it's right through here. I'm looking for where it comes to the center. Yep, this comes up here and it burns, it burns. So anything that comes off our column gets burned up here. And so this is grounded. This is an electrical ground, this whole part here. This is a 300 volt potential. So 300 volts up here, zero volts here. If there's nothing in that flame, we can't get any electrical current flowing between the two. But if we start burning organic compounds, this will carry electricity right through the flame to the ground. So we get a flow of electricity. So every time something comes through there, gets burned, we get flow of electricity. We measure that flow of electricity. The more that's burned, the greater the response. And so it's a useful detector. It's really good for most organics. We must have carbon-hydrogen uh, bonds in our compounds. And if we look at foods, the most thing we do with foods, they're carbon-hydrogen. They're the carbon-carbon bonds. Sensitivity, that's, that's getting better. 10 to the minus 12 grams per second. OK, we don't carry that around the bucket. That's, that's getting there. And again, for organic compounds, linear range, yes. Things in your sample can vary by 10 million fold in concentration. I can have a peak here, and I can have a peak 10 million times higher. And they're going to give us a linear response. So quantitation is really useful. There's some modifications to that we'll go into next time. We'll call it quits here. <laughs> Do you want to yeah. speak in the microphone? <laughs> Thank you. So um, now I know why I mixed up and had you do the Friday and me do Monday again, Gary. Because they need to know about GC before lab. Uh, and then I've already been talking about chromatography and liquid chromatography. Next week? Next week they start lab. So. So speaking of lab, I just want to point out what you guys are going to be doing. And I really hope that you go there. And there are a couple of YouTubes that I'm going to point out to that will be helpful for you to watch. So you already are in groups. And I will send an email with the groups and the names of students just to remind you. But groups A and B on Monday and group D on Wednesday will be doing HPLC lab. I will post addendums today. They are not in your lab manual, so they will be on Canvas, OK? So you will find the HPLC addendum, and you'll find the GC addendum under week four. So group C from Monday and groups E, F from Wednesday will be doing the GC lab. So. Um, Please come on time. They're packed labs, especially the GC is longer than the HPLC. Uh, so for HPLC, we're doing the caffeine uh, analysis in different beverages. We are using external standard calibration. And I'll talk about external standard versus internal on Monday. GC analysis, we are doing a semi-quantitative. There are not going to be standard curves formed. But we, you are going to determine the fatty acid composition in several oils. We'll give you unknown oils, and from their fatty acid composition, you're going to find out what oils they are. Uh, please read the chromatography chapters. The intro to chromatography, 13 and 14, are the HPLC and GC chapters. Um, there will be pre-lab quiz for HPLC and GC. So if you're doing HPLC, just solve the HPLC pre-lab quiz. If you're doing the GC, do the GC one. They're all going to be in one document, but make sure you answer just the questions related to the lab you're doing. You don't necessarily, you're, you're not going to need any calculators. I put that all the time. But you won't be entering data physically. You'll be sent the data uh, in a day and a half after you do the lab. We'll talk about that in lab. But there is a YouTube for HPLC. It's very helpful if you 
go check it out, and one for GC as well. So Gary will go over saponification of oil next time, probably, but we'll, we'll have an overview of it in lab. So you need to saponify your oil, per break the triglycerides into fatty acids, then add a methyl ester to them so that they become volatile and thermally stable. Then you can run them on GC with the FID, the flame ionization detector that Gary just talked about. Please watch the YouTube videos and come prepared to the lab.